so it's my opportunity to, uh, to also thank the Diana Davis Best Foundation, who uh, is ISI's underwriter for this event. So I want to thank them for their work uh, on, on our behalf. Um, and with that, let me introduce our moderator for tonight, uh, Mark Thiessen. He's a former White House chief uh, speechwriter, Fox News contributor, and a columnist at the Washington Post, where he writes a twice a week a column on foreign and domestic policy. In 2018, the Post syndicated his column nationally for the first and for the first time, and it was picked up by 178 newspapers. The most successful launch of a syndicated column in Washington Post history. Mark served as a member of the White House senior staff under President George W. Bush. Before that, Mark served as chief speechwriter to Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld. He was in the Pentagon when he was hit on September 11, 2001, and traveled 250,000 miles around the world with uh, Secretary Rumsfeld, including multiple visits to Afghanistan and Iraq. His inside account of the CIA's terrorist interrogation program, courting disaster, is a top 10 New York Times bestseller. He is a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where he studies American presidential leadership, intelligence, and counterterrorism. And he appears several times a week on the Fox News channel, on shows like The Story with Martha McCallum, and Special Report with Red Bear. And uh, the, the most amazing thing about Mark is that he is also an ISI alumni, and we're very grateful that he was able to make it this evening and moderate this event. So thank you, Mark. Thank you, thank you very much. And also, I'm a proud member of the Board of Trustees of the ISI, so it's a great organization. I'm so glad that they're uh, putting together these, uh, these debates on college campuses around the country and that's what you're here today. Um, so, all reasonable people agree that women's equality is good for America. And over the past six decades, women have made enormous progress on the road towards equality. Uh, today, the majority of women, the more majority of college students are women. Uh, women are leaders in the industry, government, public life, sports, entertainment, and I will tell you, journalism. Uh, and uh, the country is unquestionably better off because their talents are. Uh, Taking advantage of in our in our country and contributions, no one on this stage uh, disputes the idea that a great it's a great blessing that women's talents are increasingly accepted and more they used in the workplace. The question before us is a separate one: it's whether the feminist movement's embrace of sexual uh, sexual revolution, which we will define as the separation of sex from marriage and childbearing, which uh, closer. So many feminists saw the rejection of what they consider these patriarchal concepts of, of modesty, and courtship, and chivalry as central to their liberation. Um, but that liberation has come at a cost. Uh, the sexual revolution has resulted in the breakdown of the family, cohabitation, uh, divorce, fatherlessness, single parenthood, abortion, and childlessness. Uh, these phenomena are, are indisputable, and they've had deep social impact. Uh, they had an impact on poverty, and the expansion of the size of the government. Uh, rise in income inequality, growth of health costs, and the crisis of loneliness, both among the young and the old. Um, as Mary Everstadt says in her new book, Primal Screams, for 60 years the sexual revolution has been a great big party, and now we're at the point of the story where it's two in the morning and nobody wants to call the cops. Uh, so the question before us today is, should we call the cops? Uh, it's just, is the sexual revolution good or bad for America? And we have two outstanding debaters. Uh, who stand on opposite sides of this discussion uh, to answer this critical question. So let me, uh, to defend the sexual revolution, please welcome Roger Paul. Can you hold the Cato Institute's uh, uh, Kenneth E. Simon Chair in Constitutional Studies, which you uh, held since you were established in, uh, in 1998. Uh, you joined Cato as a senior fellow in 1988, and served as director of Cato's Center for Constitutional Studies, which you founded, uh, vice president for legal affairs, publisher of Cato's Supreme Court Review, and prior to joining Cato, during Cato, you held five senior posts in the Reagan administration. Uh, you have a BA from Columbia, uh, a PhD from the University of Chicago, and JD from the University of Washington School of uh, the George Washington University School of Law. But before that, you had a me a very interesting job, going from uh, milkman to uh, taxi driver. Tell us a little bit about uh, how you came to work. Well, in order to leave time for the debate, I'm going to just simply summarize in my odyssey. Uh, as a kid, I drank muskrats and beaver and sold pelts after church to a fur dealer. 
Uh, I was uh, interested in rhythm band. I had my students first rock and roll band. I called square dances because it was in a transition between country and western and rock. I played all three sports in, in high school. Um, I was a camp cop, board scout, and a dance counselor. Um, went off to Syracuse University, started in engineering, switched to music, and then dropped out after one year because I didn't know what I wanted to do. I went to, um, and then I joined a new rock and roll band in the Albany, Connecticut, Detroit area. I became an aluminum siding salesman, then an insurance salesman. Then I moved to New York and became a cigar sales supervisor. Then I went off to Europe and I came back and became a professional gambler of track horses. Um, and then uh, I decided to uh, go straight and become a philosopher. And so I uh, went to Columbia University and got accepted. Um, did well, drove taxi in New York, nights and weekends when I went to school during the day. Uh, graduated with honors from the University of Chicago, met my wife, also a philosopher. I sold great books in the Western world, put myself through Chicago. I was the only salesman in Britain. And uh, then I uh, went into the academic world. And then I was invited to join the Reagan administration. I served five posts, including at OPM, the State Department, the Justice Department. Then I moved to New York, established the Center for Constitutional Studies. And the rest is history. Here we are tonight. So, if you need any advice on the components, uh, I can talk to Roger after the debate. No, of course, I can. All the way to the from my first year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Guys, <laughs> All right, well, please put a round of applause for Roger. Uh, for, uh, right. Please welcome Mona Sharon. You're a graduate of Columbia University and also George Washington School of Law. Uh, you began your career at National Review, working for our mutual hero, William F. Buckley Jr. Uh, you spent six years as a regular commenter on CNN's Capital Gang and Capital Gang Sunday, served as a judge of the Pulitzer Prizes. Uh, you're a senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center and a syndicated columnist whose public paper, uh, column is published in over 150 newspapers around the country. And you're the author of uh, two bestsellers, Useful Idiots and, and Do Gooder. And your latest book, Sex Matters, which I'm sure will come into discussion today, was published in uh, 2018. And we have a lot in common because you started out working in the Reagan White House Office of Public Affairs. And I had my first job in Washington was an intern in the Washington and the White House Office of Public Affairs in the Reagan administration. And then you went off to work for Jack Hemp, and I worked for Jack Hemp at Empower America. So you're, you're a Kent Reagan Republican, I like that. Um, but your first job in politics was serving as Nancy Reagan's speech writer. Uh, so tell us a little bit about what it was like to work with Nancy Reagan. First of all, thank you very much. Um, great to be here. Thanks to the ISI and to the college Republicans. Um, thank you, University of Pittsburgh, for hosting us. Thank you all for being here. So before I explain what it was like to work as an anti Reagan speechwriter, I should back up a few years to 1981, when I had finished a couple of years at my first job, which was National Review. I was an editorial assistant there. And I decided I was going to go spend a year in Israel. So I moved to Israel, I was living there, I had a job, and one day I heard over the radio uh, that Ron Reagan would be shot. And it was the most horrifying experience to be abroad when something, a crisis like that was happening at home. I just felt so alone, I was desperate to find news, it was, everything was at a distance, I, my Hebrew wasn't very good, so I couldn't just turn on radio or the television to find out what was happening. And I was sort of frantically running around trying to figure it out, and um, some really nice Israelis helped me by translating the news. Um, just three years later, after I had come home, gone to law school, I was working as Nancy Reagan's speechwriter and traveling around the country on Air Force Two with the first thing. America is an amazing country. It really is. And that, that somebody with no family background, with no connections, with nothing except an interest in public affairs and a fascination with the people who traffic in ideas. I was able to be a 
of the school <laughs> record to the first lady of the United States. I had a blue pass. I know. <laughs> knows what that is. No. In the White House, there are different levels of passes that you get. Some are higher than others, and people are really particular about you know, how great it is that they have the highest level pass. Well, a blue pass meant that I had access because I was a first lady speechwriter, which is probably the way it's complicated. But basically, I was a low-ranking person, but it didn't matter. I had a blue pass. I could go anywhere, anywhere, and nobody would stop me. And I used to wander around the halls of the White House when I wasn't busy and just take it all in and think, I work here. Right. Yeah, it is. It was the most remarkable thing. Nancy Reagan was was great. She was very influential with her husband. They had a fantastic relationship, and uh, it was a it was a, an incomparable experience. I, I after the nineteen eighty four campaign, I then went to work for uh, President Reagan. Um, left the first lady staff, but uh, all in all, it was. Um, it was amazing, and it's, it's, as I say, it's a testament to what you can achieve in America coming from nothing. Ladies and gentlemen, we're proud of the Boston Market. This is the format of our debate. Each speaker will have 10 minutes to give their opening statement. Uh, then we'll have 40 minutes of moderated discussion. Uh, and then finally, we'll wrap up with Q&A from the audience for about 20 minutes. So let me be clear at the outset, uh, the winner of this debate will be civil discourse. Uh, we are going to, our goal tonight is to have a respectful discussion of our differences and to see if we can find some common ground because I think there are areas where our debaters agree and there are areas where our, debate, our debaters disagree and agreement is never a problem, that's always good. Um, and then, uh, so before we begin, let's just find out by a show of hands where our audience stands on this issue. So if you believe the sexual revolution has been good for America, raise your hand. If you believe the sexual revolution has been bad for America, raise your hand. If you have a mixed view or not quite sure yet, raise your hand. Awesome, there's a lot of yeah. persuadables here, yeah. that's great. So at the end of the debate, I'm gonna ask the same question and see uh, if, uh, if we move the opinion anywhere. So uh, we're gonna to turn to you first, Mona. You have 10 minutes to make your case. Okay. The British poet, Philip Larkin, wrote, the sexual, sexual intercourse began in 1963, which was rather late for me, between the end of the Chattery Band and the Beatles' first LP. Well, the 1950s, which we usually think of as a period of staid respectability, not so much. Um, at the time, the Kinsey Report was flying off shelves, uh, Payton Place was very popular, um, and of course Elvis was the great singing sensation. He was pretty crazy. <clears throat> now, I'm not here to deny that loosening standards of sexual behavior have brought some benefits to society. And those benefits, like equality for gay people and release from crippling shame for unwed mothers, get a lot of attention. We pay less attention to the high price that we pay for sexual freedom. So let me sketch some of the costs for three groups, men, women, and children. For men, sexual revolution would seem to be an unmixed blessing. Free from centuries of scarcity, men now have access to sex in infinite varieties. As Woody Allen said, Pizza is a lot like sex. When it's good, it's really good. When it's bad, it's still pretty really good. <laughs> this is less true for women, by the way, than it is for men, and I will get to that. So men have more sexual opportunities than women. But the changes brought in society have not overall been so good for men. They are falling behind women in rates of high school graduation. 60% of bachelor's degrees now go to women. Men are more likely to be unemployed, addicted, and alcoholic. They are more likely to commit suicide. They are less likely than in the past to have a strong relationship with their children. And they are more likely to die young than women. But well, what about women? When I was in college in the 1970s, the popular slogan was, Chase makes waste. It was the dawn of the sexual revolution, and 
it was considered a victory for the sisterhood if women used a man for sex. Now today, if we were to plaster something on an elevator in the University of St. Chase Mays waist, waist, I suspect that this would be considered some sort of violation of sexual propriety, which is interesting. Well, the prevalence of sexual assault charges on American campuses is evidence that the sexual revolution has not turned out to be the utopia its enablers promised. The overwhelming majority of these accusations are leveled by women. Lisa Wade is a sociologist who studied sexual behavior among college students, and she found that when she spoke to women, they felt that they had inherited a right to express their sexuality from the women's movement of the 1960s and 70s. But what they found in the 21st century was really different, just quite disappointing. Quote, they didn't feel like equals on the sexual playground, more like jungle gyms. Also, the Me Too movement is a pent-up power of protest against the sexual revolution and the complete destruction of rules and mores regarding sex. The women who are stepping forward to object to being balked at, all exposed to pornography, sexted against their wishes, groped, manhandled, and assaulted, they think of themselves as expressing feminist self-respect. But another way to look at it is that they are fed up with the anything-goes culture that the sexual revolution has bequeathed to them. The reaction of Feminist Jessica Valenti to the Aziz Ansari story. By the way, does everybody know about the Aziz Ansari story? Yes? Okay. Um, was very, it captured some of what I'm trying to convey here. She said, quote, a lot of men will read that post about Aziz Ansari and see an everyday reasonable sexual interaction. But part of what women are saying right now is that what the culture considers normal sexual encounters are not working for us and are oftentimes the sexual revolutionaries promised that free sex would rid the human race of guilt, shame, jealousy, and inequality. Men and women would enjoy carnal pleasures equally, and the hated double standard would be inspired. But, as the Roman poet Horace reminded us, you can drive out nature with a pitchfork, but she still hurries Human nature is stubborn. Even with freely <laughs> available abortion, and even with the old double standard discredited, women still aren't just like men when it comes to sex. They are more easily hurt, both physically and psychologically. They are more often disappointed, they are more often disgusted, and they are more likely to have regrets. Women are also, because of the changes that our society has undertaken in the wake of the sexual revolution, more likely to have trouble to find a marriageable man than in the past. They're more likely to be raising children on their own. At least half a dozen studies of industrialized countries has found that women are less happy than men and less happy than their mothers or grandmothers were at the same stage of life. Finally, the biggest losers from the sexual revolution are children. The decline of the intact two-parent family has been a disaster for kids. <clears throat> Both boys and girls have suffered from the decline of intact families, but boys more. So in 1965, the illegitimacy rate among whites was 3%, which was about 23% for blacks. In 2013, the rate for blacks had reached 71%. And for whites, 36%. Great for Hispanic, 53 What this means is that more than half of American kids will spend more than half of their formative years between 0 and 16 with only one parent. Fatherlessness, which is mostly what we're experiencing in our society, there are some fathers who raise kids alone, but mostly it's mothers. It's tied to a raft of troubles for grown children. Kids growing up without dads struggle in school, have more emotional distress, and less self-confidence. 
Girls who are not cautious have body image troubles and are more likely to get pregnant as teenagers. Boys in fatherless homes are more likely to get in trouble with the law. About 70% of kids in juvenile detention are from single parent families. So are 75% of youth rapists, 75% of young addicts, and 90% of runaways and homeless children. The teen suicide rate tripled between 1950 and 1990, exactly the period when families were beginning to unravel. And studies have shown close links between teen depression and family structure. And then it turns it on itself. Because boys who grow up without fathers are less likely to attend college or be employed than their sisters who grow up in the same circumstances, there is a decline in marriageable men. <clears throat> By 2023, three women will earn college degrees for two men. And since women like to marry men who have the same amount of education as they do, that presents a problem. Men are declining in their labor force participation, and that presents a problem as well, since most women say they want to marry a man who has a job. We have an epidemic of loneliness. We have the explosion of diseases of despair in this country, which include alcoholism and drug abuse, which has actually caused life expectancy in America to decline. The sexual revolution <clears throat> was about individual choices and freedom from constraint. But some constraints are necessary. When adults fail to practice self-control, children pay the price. And when those children grow up, they are less able to practice the kind of habits that make for a good life. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mona, and thank you, Mike. Also, want to thank ISI and the Kid Republicans for holding this debate, not least because it will give the students here uh, at least a glimpse of the difference between uh, conservatives and libertarians on the political right. Uh, but that means that if you were expecting a full fledged battle between left and right on the question, before us, you'll be disappointed. In fact, I want to begin by commending Mona's recent book, Sex Matters, How Modern Feminism Lost Touch with Science, Love, and Common Sense, because I agree with most of what's in it. So if this is going to be a debate, I've got to find some distance between the two of us, maybe some silver lining to the oblique picture that Mona paints of the sexual revolution and its aftermath. And I'm going to do that by first noting that the proposition before us, the sexual revolution has been more good than bad, asks not for a categorical condemnation or praise of sexual revolution, but for a relative appraisal. But that leads to a second preliminary issue. Even if we knew how to weigh the good and the bad, it's come from the sexual revolution. At what point in time do we make the assessment? Or to put the proposition somewhat differently, on balance, how has sex the sexual revolution worked out? I'll argue shortly, but on balance and likely in the long run, it has and will work out okay. Mona herself wants occasionally to some good that's come from the revolution, like greater equality for women in various domains, and she also knows that some things that she rightly laments, like divorce and out of wedlock birth rates, are now trending lower. So perhaps this experiment hasn't yet run its course. It may turn out better than it's looked at various points along the way. But another question that comes to the fore at the outset is this. How much of the bad of the bad in Mona's book can be attributed to the sexual revolution? We see many social, economic, and legal forces at play over the past half century. From the rise of the drug culture, including opiates more recently, to the decline of manufacturing jobs, understood here in this area, 
to the massive growth of the welfare state and more. All have taken their toll on families, which is Bowman's main concern. To be sure, it's hard to disaggregate and assess the relative contributions of such factors to the pathology she cites. I flag this simply to suggest that the sexual revolution is not a whole story, nor, as a hasty to add, does Mona say that it is. With those preliminary remarks at hand, let me now sketch an argument on the other side. In a nutshell, it is that I think Mona gives short shrift to the good that's come from the sexual revolution and even more will come, I hope, over time. And for that, I'll start with the fundamental question. What exactly do we mean by the sexual revolution? From her book, it's fairly clear that she means the change in social attitudes and behavior regarding sex and even more the sexes that began in America in the 1960s. But that presupposes a pre-revolutionary period, perhaps even a golden age, when we didn't have the problem she catalogs as the revolution unfolded. Well, as it happens, I've got about 15 years on the moment. The 1950s were my formative years, so I saw both sides of the transition, and I lived through the birth of the sexual revolution. In fact, I was a student at Columbia University when sex, drugs, and rock and roll took over the campus. And even though I was on the other side of the barricades from the SDS folks, I knew that the sexual revolution, part of the larger political revolution that was taking place in the 1960s, did not arise from nothing. In her book, Mona focuses to a large extent on the sexual revolution as it's taken place on the nation's campuses. Given that focus, we should note that it was well into the 1960s when colleges and universities began abandoning their in loco parentis role, which required, among other things, that women sign in and out of their dorms, that they be in their dorms by a certain hour, and that all students live on campus under the watchful eye of their parent-like college guardians, unless they live with their parents. Then, too, when the pill came out, you could get it only with a doctor's prescription, which was difficult if you were in America. But if you were a student at Yale, you found that the state of Connecticut had criminalized the sale and use of contraceptives, a statute that the Supreme Court found unconstitutional only in 1965. And woe unto you if you were gay or a lesbian, student or fully adult, you stayed in the closet because the sanctions were often of a criminal nature. In general, then, it was such stifling social and legal restrictions that led to demands by the burgeoning baby boom generation for more sexual freedom. Unfortunately, as with all revolutions, there were many unfortunate turns along the way, which Mona has well cataloged, especially the feminist attacks on men and family, the bizarre failure to recognize the innate differences between men and women, the appalling abortion culture that emerged after Roe v. Wade, the vacuous hookup culture on today's campuses, and the campus rape mess, as she puts it. In the 10 minutes I've got for this opening statement, I have the time to address those issues. So let me look instead for that silver lining I mentioned earlier. And I'll do it by repairing to the nation's first principles by way of framework and authority. Those principles are found, of course, in the Declaration of Independence, which speaks of equal rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We look on the right to pursue happiness because it contains a distinction that too little is noticed and appreciated today between objective rights and subjective values. The Declaration says we all have equal rights not to happiness, but to pursue happiness, to do whatever makes us happy, provided we respect the equal rights of others in the process. That freedom, I submit, is at the core 
of the sexual revolution. Not the aberrations like abortion or no-fault divorce or date rape, but the freedom we all have to find our own way through life, even if it means making mistakes along the way, which we all do. In her opposition to same-sex marriage, Mona has challenged that freedom because it leads, she believes, to threatening marriage by redefining it, quote, as a matter of personal fulfillment for adults rather than first and foremost as a stable environment for children, end of quote. So far, however, the evidence runs the other way. Gay marriage is not undermining straight marriage. But she learns also, in a broader context, that when it comes to sex, people need rules. She's right. But who's to make those rules? Don't look to government, and Mona doesn't, to her credit, as so many others do. But don't look to ever evolving society either, over which we have little control. Look to yourselves. It's your life. You're in charge, responsible for your own happiness. Life is a learning experience, but we've got to be free to make our own mistakes, to learn from them, to learn the truth that Mona articulates so well, that we flourish and are happiest when we live within the bounds that nature itself imposes on us, which we recognize and respect, for example, the natural differences between men and women. Sometimes we live, with, sometimes we have to reach bottom before we understand that, insofar as the sexual revolution helps us to see both that and helps us, helps people to have the confidence to take charge of their own lives, it may be <coughs> yielding more good than bad. Thank you. statements. Now we're going to go to the moderated discussion. So Mona, Roger laid out a pretty vivid picture of what the state of affairs was in the 1950s before the sexual revolution um, in terms of the stipends that were <laughs> felt by a lot of women, by gays, by other groups. So you're an incredibly successful woman. You've worked in the White House, published best-selling books, successful syndicated columnist. Would all of that progress that you've had in your life be possible without the sexual revolution? and all those changes, and can, is there a way to preserve that progress without going back to the 1950s? Thanks so much. So, um, one of the distinctions that I try to draw in Sex Matters is that between women's progress, which I celebrate and applaud and appreciate, um, all of the changes that have been brought in women's roles and women's opportunities in the world, and the sexual revolution, which I don't think necessarily had to be wedded to the women's movement, to feminism. I think the feminists <coughs> made a mistake when they signed on with the sexual revolutionaries and made it all part of one thing. I think that we could have had the corner offices and the Senate seats and the uh, seats on the uh, boards of major companies and all the other things um, without agreeing that um, sex would be, uh, you know, that, that men could expect sex uh, just as a, 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 as a as a normal, you know, ex expectation on a first date or whatever. Uh, you know, the, the, um, the problem with, with sexual revolution from women's perspective is that it actually robs us of autonomy. In the past, one of the great things about the pre-sexual revolution era was that women got support for being able to say no. They got support for being able to say, you know, you cannot expect, you, you cannot expect, the, uh, the, uh, uh, a day cannot expect sex right away. There was social support for that. Now, if a woman turns a man down, she's seen as insulting him personally. And that's much trickier and uh, unfortunate for women. I'll leave it there. Uh, oh, I do want to just add one thing to what Roger said uh, about gay marriage, because 
It is true that before the Supreme Court ruling in Obergefell, I opposed the idea of uh, legalizing gay marriage. Since it is now the law of the land, I am taking a let's wait and see attitude. I hope it works out. Um, I hope that the children who are raised by gay couples get everything they need. I have many gay friends, um, some of whom are raising kids. Uh, but, uh, but so my attitude now is, you know, I'm not advocating for changing the law. I hope it works out, but I have my doubts because I do think that the tie between fathers and mothers and, and, um, and mothers and children uh, is, is key to uh, family stability. So we will see. The jury's out. Mark, could I respond to sure. something that Mona uh, said in her comments just a moment ago? Um, I joined Mona in lamenting some of the terms that the sexual revelation, revolution has taken. In fact, most of the terms, because I said I really enjoyed her book. And if you really want to dig into this subject, her book, Sex Matters, is a tour de force. Uh, and it is, and it is uh, rich with data. I don't know how she had time. You must have had some great assistance because the digging of the details, the studies in that is just, it's voluminous. And it is a really wonderful book. Uh, so I commend it to all of you. Now, I quite agree that it's unfortunate that it did take this turn, but I don't know what we could have done about it. Because the social forces, which were the primary forces behind that, you cite, for example, the three books that came out in 1970. There was Betty Friedan in 1963, the godmother of the uh, women's movement, the feminist movement. But then the three books that came out in 1970 took a real radical turn and uh, what, what could be done about that? It's almost as though you've got to let this cancer work its way through the system until, as I said at the close of my remarks, you reach rock bottom and you see how empty and, and destitute these people are, and then you can start from coming up from them. Well, thank you for that so much. Thanks so much for the comments about the book. Well, and thanks for your comments, too, uh, which are very, very thoughtful. Look, uh, <clears throat> one of the problems with the sexual revolution is that it, it cemented this separation between love and sex. And I think for women, that's, that's a really harmful thing. That I think as a, as a sex, we tend to connect the two more. And I think we help men to connect the two under the right social circumstances. Um, love, commitment, reliability, stability, these things are incredibly important to women for basic biological reasons. We're the ones who get pregnant, we're the ones who have babies, we're the ones who need a guy to stick with us throughout that process and, and take care of us, honestly, and take care of our kids. And in a society where we've severed that bond between sex and love, Everything becomes just transactional. Men feel less um, social pressure to stick with their wives and children. And, um, and then the men themselves become lonely and unhappy and unfulfilled, and they're not happy and they don't have connection to their kids. So what I'm arguing for is a revivification of the ideals of fidelity, self-control, sexual restraint, um, that used to characterize uh, pre-sexual revolution society. I realize we can't roll back everything, but we can have, you know, homosexuals demanded the right to gay marriage. They want to be married. They want the benefits that marriage confers. I would love to see non-gay people have a new appreciation for the importance of marriage in their own lives. So before we, uh, I want to get to the solutions and how we come out of the tailspin. Um, but let's examine, you know, Roger said, you said we, we have to hit bottom. Uh, I'm not sure, we, let's assess whether we hit bottom yet or whether there's more bottom to come and some of the down, the down uh, side effects. Um, so we just had a debate, uh, I just hosted a debate last week at Texas Christian University on the rise of identity politics on both the left and the right. 
uh, that are royal in our politics today, Mary Everstadt, a, friend of, a mutual friend of all of ours, uh, has a new book out uh, in which she basically argues that the rise of identity politics is a direct result of the sexual revolution, that, uh, that putting aside all the moral arguments against it, the, the fact is that divorce, single parenthood, childlessness, shrinking families, shrinking extended families, uh, are having the effect of new, reducing the number of people we call our own. And so because we have people we have people pass through life without fathers, sisters, brothers, others, she calls it the great scattering, uh, that we're, the result is a great vacuum and people are seeking identity in groups because they've lost the identity that used to unite us, which is the family. Uh, do you agree with her assessment, Roger and, uh, and Mona? And, uh, and what do we do about it? Okay, well, at the base of identity politics is victimization. And that means that if you are of this, that, or the other category, you are the victim of society. Uh, well, white men, of course, they're the least, at least the admirable category of people in society today. Um, but this, this victimization and identity politics is just pitting people against people, and it, 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 it creates vast jobs for professors and for especially college and university administrators who are deans of this, that, or the other identity group. Uh, and um, I think Mona would agree that so much of this has come out of the universities today. It is, a, it is an appalling development. And until we get control over the educational system from preschool to the universities, we will not have um, a, a, a chance uh, at this juggernaut, which has been going on since the revolution, the political revolution of the 1960s, of which the sexual revolution is a part. I don't see the sexual revolution uh, as larger than a political revolution. I see it as part of the political revolution, which is dedicated largely to the politicization of everything. But Mona, I mean, Mary's argument is a little bit different. She, is, she doesn't defend the identity politics, but she's, she's sympathetic to people who pursue identity politics because she sees them as people who have suffered, who, have, uh, who are struggling, and who are seeking group identity because we're tribal by nature. And they, you know, you, you have black identity politics is a big thing. Just look at what's happened to the black family uh, in America today, uh, especially in the, in, the, in the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum. Isn't, is, is it fair to say that the that central revolution is at the root cause of identity politics? Look, it's a really, it's an interesting insight. And um, certainly um, the, the idea that we are just not meant by nature to be solitary individuals. We're meant to be parts of who born into families. Families are our most important relationships. They're the foundation of <coughs> communities. Um, and, um, and people do need to feel that they belong to something. And so I, I have long thought that the, one of the reasons that our politics have become so poisoned recently is because of the decline of family attachments and people feel a need to belong to something, and therefore they pour some of that passion that ought to go to more intimate relationships into political affiliations. And this is what I am, and I'm for this group and against that group. Um, and uh, so I, I do think I do think there's there's something there. Um, but uh, uh, there was a point that that uh, Roger made, which I can't remember now. So just. Go on, and it'll come for me. <laughs> Let's talk about the the loneliness epidemic, which which you said that there was a really interesting Wall Street Journal story a little while ago that talked about how the baby boomers are aging alone more than any generation in U.S. history. Um, they prized individuality. This is what according to the journal, the baby boomers prized individuality and generally had fewer children, and engaged in marriages in greater number, in, ended marriages in greater numbers than previous generations. More than one in four boomers is divorced or never married. Census figures show about one in six lives alone, and 
research suggests that this is causing a huge health crisis. People who live alone, who have no one, and no one around them, are more likely to have depression, cognitive decline, dementia, um, and etc. And the journal estimated that the lack of social contact among older adults will cost Medicare, Medicare $6.7 billion a year. Um, so the generation gave us the sexual revolution with private individuality is now suffering mental health and physical crisis as a result, and we're going to, it is exacerbating the fiscal crisis, Roger. Uh, you guys, a limited government uh, libertarian, are you concerned with the health costs uh, that, are, that are being attended by the, by the, the loneliness epidemic of the sexual revolution? Well, I've been very exercised over the national debt, which is a function of the entitlement problem in America, Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. The debt is now going toward $23 trillion. That's with a T. The unfunded liability, federal, state, and local, vastly exceeds that amount, it's estimated to be over $100 trillion. You young people in the audience worry about climate change and global warming, about which there is a great deal of speculation. There's no speculation here. You are about to be saddled with vast debts. Thank you, by the way, for the Social Security checks I have. <laughs> you are about to be saddled with vast debts that uh, there will be only one way to solve, either address the problem straightforwardly or continue borrowing, at which point we will have to start printing money. And where that goes, look at Venezuela, if you want a textbook example of it. But now we get back to your question, uh, uh, Mark. It, it is probably the, the loneliness of so many in the, um, in the uh, baby boom generation. I've not studied this closely, but my sense is that the explosion in divorces over the last several decades, which fortunately is a trend that is starting to come down, that that largely explains this. Um, and. Yes, Mona documents in her book the problem of um, singlehood is an economic problem. Uh, married couples uh, can live much more efficiently economically than two individuals living separately. And this is especially a problem for unwed mothers who are raising children, as we all know. And so uh, it is true that. And I mean, this moment goes into as well in the book. It is true that the, the aspects of the sexual revolution, which uh, were utopian in many respects, the idea of the, um, the, the, the perfect being the enemy of the good, has animated a lot of our thinking. Uh, over the last several decades, and the inability to compromise and make do, to use an old term, uh, with the situation you are in, is, to my mind, at the base of so much of the pathology that we see and the uh, baby boom loneliness issue that you've pointed to. Mona, you you pointed out also that the loneliness epidemic is not just taking place among the elderly, but it's also taking place among the young. Um, and uh, the millennials are delaying marriage or not marrying at all, more so than any generation in recorded history in the, this country. Um, and studies show that one of the reasons is they're going to delay marriage is because the, the high divorce rates of their parents, uh, but they have no example. Um, and so the social, but there's the loneliness effect of that, the social effects of that. There's a, the most popular course right now at Boston College is a course by Professor uh, Kerry Cornyn, who basically teaches people how to date. Because the, 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 it's, a, it's literally, she, the class assignment is you have to ask somebody out on a date. Uh, you can't do it by text. You have to do it in person. Uh, you have to pay if you're the asker. Um, and just basic, the basic social script, and it's the most popular course because young people 
have lost the script uh, because of their gender, because of generation, and and they're desperate to have people. There's a they, they don't like the hookup culture. They don't like this. They want to be. They want to find. They want to find someone who they can relate to and have a relationship with. And they and it seems like they they don't know the script anymore. That's right. And one of the other things that Carrie Cronin requires in her course is that the gate has to be over by 10 p.m. There can be no alcohol consumed during the first day. Um, and it can't be a movie because that precludes conversation. Um, so you know, a long walk is good, a dinner date, oh, that's all fine, lunch. But, uh, but anyway, the, and the, the, kids, uh, the kids love it. She's spoken now at something like 75 different campuses around the country. People are very, you know, they go to her for advice on dating and, um, and you know this 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 is I think a a, a, a signal that about rising force or uh, unwed parenting and so forth. Those don't affect the college educated upper third in our society nearly as much as they affect the lower two thirds. Um, people who come from highly educated families tend to get from the media, from movies, and from the culture in general, in books, magazines, everything. And they don't get the message that marriage is really important, that, that, that delaying childbirth until you're married is really important for a successful life, that getting educated is an important uh, life goal. And that's why we see such a divergence in our society between the highly educated who follow this life script that leads to success and stability and happiness, and the others who are falling into very chaotic adult relationships, living together, having a baby with him, and then with him, and or or you know, getting married, getting divorced, um, and it's it's really a, a problem that is also contributing. The, the sexual revolution has led to a situation where we are exacerbating and aggravating the problems of social inequality. So, Roger, you're a religious charity and you're a limited government, right? Um, and you gave a recent speech, uh, I think, to the Federalist Society, where you track the rise of government starting with the progressive era, gained steam under liberalism, then it was really under uh, the new left of the 1960s when government uh, really took off and, and grew. Um, one of the, isn't one of the impacts of the sexual revolution the growth of the state? Because the state has to brain rule the, bro the broken family. So African American poverty rate is eight percent among blacks uh, among uh, single. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah. married uh, black families, but black single mothers is forty six percent. And so the rise of fatherlessness, uh, the rise in poverty, which leads to a rise in dependency, and the cause of we have more public welfare, more public housing, Medicaid, uh, entitlements, food stamps, other public support. So hasn't the re sexual revolution been a major driver in the growth of government? Yes. Because this will give me an opportunity to lay on something more theory than that. Um, we live in this country under limited government, individual liberty, and individual responsibility, more or less for 150 years. But at the end of the 19th century, with the rise of progressivism and into the early decades of the 20th century, we saw a fundamental shift in the climate of ideas in America. The progressives effectively rejected the vision of the founders in limited government, individual liberty, and responsibility. They saw government not as a necessary evil, but as an engine of good, an instrument through which to pursue all manner of social and economic programs. They were social engineers coming from the elite schools of the Northeast. They were looking to European models of good government, Bismarck's social security scheme and the like. They were looking to, in ethics, to British utilitarianism, which had replaced natural law and ethics and natural rights on which the American system was founded. The idea was that law, policy, judgment were to be justified, not with reference to whether they secured our natural and other rights, but rather whether they provided the greatest good for the greatest number. 
So this is a theory of ethics that lends itself peculiarly to statutory government, not a judge-made law deciding cases or controversies before the court, but a policy pursued by legislatures and it opened the door for all manner of pursuit of things that one party or the other thought to be good. And that was the beginning of the explosion of legislature and the social welfare programs that you asked about. And it was resisted in the early decades by the court uh, of the early decades of the 20th century. But by the time we get to the New Deal and Roosevelt, shifting the focus of the progressives from state-level political activism to federal level, we saw the court, the Supreme Court, rejecting Roosevelt's programs. After the landslide election of 1936, when all but two states went for Roosevelt, Roosevelt unveiled his infamous court packing scheme, his threat to pack the court with six new members. Not even Congress would go along with it. Nevertheless, the court got the message. There was the famous switch in time that saved nine, and it began effectively rewriting the Constitution without a benefit of constitutional amendment. And it did it in three main steps. It eviscerated the fundamental principle of the Constitution, the idea that Congress has only limited powers, and then it bifurcated the Bill of Rights and it jettisoned the non-delegation doctrine, which led to the modern executive state through which most law today is made. It's not made by Congress, it's made by the 400-some executive branch agencies in Washington today. And that has grown and grown. And as the government grows, people have become more and more dependent on government. And when they do, they lose their sense of individual responsibility. And this has been the pattern for the last 80 to 90 years. The divide, the rise of the sexual revolution and its aftermath is only one part of this trend. That's why I see if we can in start to instill a greater sense of individual responsibility, it will address not simply the problems that have emerged from the sexual revolution, but the even larger problems that have, been, that have emerged from the modern welfare state, the modern redistributive and welfare state. And so when you hear these women who are victims of the, uh, the um, you know, what's the, a day, a day rate, some of them very legitimate victims, but others uh, not so. When you see the women who are victims of the hookup culture, who say, I was sort of pressured into doing it, the answer is, get a hold of yourself. It's your life. Your sense of responsibility must come to the fore. Stop blaming other people. Now that sounds like a preacher, I know, but what else can you say? Otherwise, it's a person wallowing in victimization. And that's what we must resist at all costs. It's your life. You live it. You're responsible for it. Don't blame others. It's a moment, I mean, Roger makes an important point about the about the hookup culture and, and campus rape culture. Um, but there's also a problem, uh, you, you talked about the Me Too movement as a sort of a signal flare of distress. There, we also hear a lot about toxic masculinity today. Um, and the idea that, you know, we uh, about half of all children in America are brought up in single parent homes, mostly raised by women, as you pointed out. That means a large number of boys have no one to teach them how to be men. Um, and so they are, they, 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 do you think that the, the sexual revolution is responsible for this increase in male predation, which gets given rise to the Me Too movement as a responsible? I do, and um, let me just, uh, let me just agree wholeheartedly with Roger about debt, about, about the, uh, the decline of our constitutional order, all of that I emphatically agree with. I would take issue, however, with his characterization of the women victims because um, it's true that there are some women um, who are playing the victim card, if, if you will, 
Um, but there are many who say, what can you say? And I would say that, that lots of women would say, what we want is for men to take responsibility for themselves, and for men to behave properly <laughs> like gentlemen. And unfortunately, there is very little emphasis in our society about the way men should behave. Um, the, the signals are very mixed, and a lot of them are incredibly negative. Um, I wrote a column defending the Gillette commercial. I don't know how many of you saw that. A lot of people got a lot of attention. A lot of consumers hated it. They thought it was, you know, sort of playing into this PC world. I didn't think so. I thought it was, you know, it was showing maybe it's a little slightly PC, but a lot of it was good. It was showing men, you know, responding to bad behavior, loudish behavior on the part of other men, and calling them out. And we need a great deal more of that. Um, yes, women should take responsibility for their choices as well, but, uh, but men very much as, uh, need, need to step up. Uh, well, can I just interrupt you? Yeah, no, I, I agree with what you just said, but you know there comes a point where if a man misbehaves, this, the woman just slaps him in the face. What's wrong with that? That will wake him up, presumably. Uh, that, those were the days. That <laughs> That is what people used to do. It is, but you know, the, the, but one of the things that I that I um, charge feminists with is denying to women male um, chivalry. Feminists uh, heap scorn on the idea of chivalry. They so say we don't need it. You know, I can open my own goddamn door. Um, you know, and all of that. And in fact, that was a huge mistake because. Women need men's protection. They need that sense of honor that men were used to be instilled with, that you would never in a hundred years harm a woman. You would never uh, strike a woman. That was why a woman could safely slap a man's face if he got fresh, because she knew he'd been raised, he'd never raise a hand to her in return. That's not true anymore. Obviously, there was always white people, and that's a different thing. But, but the, I'm talking about the social mores that have changed. Um, and uh, there's a really interesting book called Motherhood Deferred that was written by a feminist who talked about how, looking back on her life, she realized that it was a mistake to deny that women like and need men's chivalry. That that is part of the dance between the sexes that was good for both. And uh, I thought it was brave of her as a feminist to acknowledge that. So, so Roger, you said in your introduction that we need rules, which I think everyone no, like, quoted. Oh, you quoted. Okay, so you don't think we need rules. Okay, so we all agree. We so we, all of us here, sit down on this, but I but am believe in a free society based on order of living. Right, that uh, you know, if we have liberty without order, we're not really free. We're living in a hostile state of nature, sort of, you know, a solitary, poor, nasty, producer sort. So we need order. There are only two sources of order. There's the self and the state, right? And then there's there's no the society. <laughs> but I mean, that, 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 that you can get it from culture or from a parliament. We can get it from self uh, self control. Or legislation. Well, that's three levels. We got state, society, and self. Okay. Well, the, I'm including the self within the society. That so the society is a bunch of individuals behaving according to certain customs and rules, right? But you have to have rules and order in order to have a truly free society. We've cast away all the rules uh, in terms of the, the sexual revolution. We've gotten to the point where all these downstream effects are happening, and there is we are we are slowly, at least in the sexual room world, moving into Hobbes' state of nature. Um, and so if the, a society pours a vacuum, so we are going to either have, a, there's going to be a response, and it's either going to be self-control, or it's going to be more government. So shouldn't you, as an advocate of limited government, be very concerned that we've <coughs> thrown away all these society's rules, uh, and that this is going to lead to a response in which we need more government to, to solve the problem? No, because the government doesn't solve the problem, unless we turn to the police state, and nobody wants that. But I come back to my three part. Um, the truth collapsed into two. Okay. And, and that is to say, government, society, and self. Um, I don't want government to set the rules. Uh, society will always have rules of varying kinds. But ultimately, society will be mixed. Uh, 
it will be composed of people who have ruled themselves in proper ways and people who don't. And so therefore, when we speak of society, which part is to be pointed to as characterizing, quote, society, society is a mix of the two and the shades in between those two. And so we come back to the most important element in that three-part analysis, namely the self. There will always be louts. There will always be uh, people who are uh, reprobates. But that doesn't mean you have to be one of them. And so we come back to Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics, namely, what kind of a person do you want to be? And what will be the virtues that you will aspire to and the vices that you will achieve? And that means what will you become as a person in your own mind? And that's the greatest reward of all. If it turns out that others appreciate that, such as those you love, it's all the sweeter. But at the end of the day, it's what you think of yourself that matters. Can I jump in with a tiny bit of disagreement? We've had a lot of disagreement now. <laughs> <laughs> so we need some disagreement. So I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to offer this. <clears throat> so you're right. It's a, it's a difficult balance. It's, it's a balance. You have to have um, a certain amount of strength, <laughs> that of, uh, 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 the in mediating institutions of society. Um, and uh, people on this panel tend to like a smaller state, but um, what do you say to the idea that there are certain things that we know are so harmful that they do require state action? So, for example, regulating pornography. Um, there is no question that pornography is very harmful to the society in general and that civil society has done a terrible job of trying to curb it. Uh, the churches have failed, uh, you know, feminist groups have failed. Maybe it is a role for the state. What do you say? Do I say no? Yeah, okay. <laughs> the role of the state is to enforce tort and criminal law, torts of uh, accidents, criminal law, especially between strangers, and to enforce contracts. In other words, to secure our rights and to provide certain public goods like clean air, infrastructure, and the like. The role of society is to control everything beyond that by suasion. And if it involves torts, crimes, if it's constitutional, I mean, or if it's contractual breaches, then you turn to the state. If it involves something short of that, no. It turns out that pornography does have perverse implications for some people, perhaps many people, but whose rights does it violate? It's like the laws that we've had in this country from the beginning that have gradually been found unconstitutional. There were laws, for example, in colonial times uh, that regulated dress. Uh, with, you couldn't wear loud clothes, for example. Uh, I gave you the case of Griswold v. Connecticut, which criminalized uh, sale and use of contraceptives. Now, there are bad consequences of doing that. Sometimes people uh, will not, uh, people, well, I won't go into that, but in any event, uh, there's a, uh, there are um, laws that require people to send their children to government schools. Uh, laws that prohibited teaching in the German language. That's a 1923 and the other was a 1925 case. Lots of laws like that. The laws against pornography. Pornography, its production and consumption does not violate anyone's rights. And that's why the state should not be involved in it. Even though there may be harmful consequences in the sense that people become influenced by it. But if you go down that road, you will find Ulysses would be prohibited, as indeed we all know it was, because it was thought salacious. Well, gotcha, gotcha. I'm just, I'm just, <laughs> 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 I'm just, 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 I'
social argument doesn't necessarily um, persuade. Um, you know, they're persuading you. We always draw a lot questions, but are there we I think we both of you agree. Wait, sorry, can I just make a yes. quick quick yes, question? Yes. Okay, so I would just say, um, you said that the point is that the pornography violates no one's rights, and I would submit to you that there are lots of laws that we would not want to remove from the books that do not violate any human's rights, but that we like anyway. For example, laws against cruelty to animals. <laughs> it's a matter of just of policing morals, and I'm for it. I am a Jew, and I cannot justify it by securing rights, not animal rights, and so forth. I would also prohibit uh, people walking down the street naked. I suppose it depends which people are walking down the street. <laughs> um, but uh, you get my point. Well, let's, let's, let's close this discussion by talking about the solutions. I think you both agree that there have been uh, there have been major negative, you've accepted, you've accepted much of Mona's analysis of the impact that the sexual revolution has had on society, followed this abortion and all the rest of it. Um, and it seems like we're, the time has come for a counter-revolution uh, of some sort. Um, putting aside, how do we do that without involving the state? Uh, you, you for, and, and trying to come to some agreement, you know, Mona, you suggested, for example, that we need a a campaign to make marriage the norm again, akin to Mothers Against Drunk Drive. Yeah. Uh, that we need a social movement uh, to to restore, to, to promote marriage, uh, that re reconnect sex with love, reconnect sex with marriage and childbearing. Um, how do we do that? Right, so... And would um, you support that? <laughs> um, so I, I do think that it requires some kind of a social movement, a recognition of the importance of this institution for our society. I would love to see it as a, a matter of children's welfare and, uh, and of reducing inequality and poverty in our society, um, because those things are just indisputable. If you go to any major foundation that works with poor people, whether it's the Andy Casey Foundation or many others, and you ask them, you know, what would be your your um, you know preferred outcome uh, for for poor families? They would acknowledge that it would be great if more people got it. They they may not say this, but if, but if, if if marriage were the norm, they do agree that married couples um, have much easier lives, much lower rates of poverty, much lower rates of problems for their children, um, and um, and so. It, and yet, it has it is it is controversial to present this as a policy uh, that, that this is something that we should encourage people to do. Um, Charles Murray put it in very pithy fashion when he said, "We need elites to preach what they practice," and I think that would be a great thing. So, what I would envision is a national campaign spearheaded by Barack Obama. Um, and uh, other celebrities, but Barack Obama has been great on this topic. He's given a number of speeches where he's talked about the importance of being a father and of, uh, uh, fulfilling his responsibilities. He was raised by a single mother and, and he feels he suffered for that and so on. I would love to see a, a campaign by, by celebrities, by, by public figures, by influential people of all kinds to uh, stress the importance of marriage, to stress the importance of what I mentioned earlier, the success <coughs> sequence it's called, which is you get your education, then you get married, and then you have children in that, get a job, um, and have children in that order. And if you do that, your chances of living in <coughs> poverty are less than 2%. So that's what I would like to see. Robert, do you agree? Yes, I do. And I would approach the question that you put to us, Mark, as follows. First, there is, there is so much that is wrong with our educational system at every level. Um, at the public school level, um, it doesn't, I don't need to, say much more than the fact that public schools are failing mass portions of our population. And the effort 
of parents to get their children out of these failing schools and into a small private school the charter school uh, has to be encouraged to get to see people like um, de Blasio and de Blasio in New York going just the other direction. There is a wonderful movie that has just come out called Miss Virginia, which is the story of a single mother in Washington, D.C., who tried for the longest time to get her son of, of not only a failing school, but a school that was extraordinarily dangerous to him. And what she was up against with the teachers' union, with the local administrators, and so forth, it is a remarkable movie how she succeeded. And I commend it to all of you if it comes your way. It's called Miss Virginia. But the second point I would make beyond the need to privatize education as much as possible so that parents could take charge of the education of their children because they have the greatest interest, interest in doing so. I know what it's like with my kids to deal with the Montgomery County just outside of Washington uh, School District. We're talking to all the people who are public in Montgomery County. There are, 42, there are 42 elected offices in the county. Everyone is up to my bed. It's a one-party county. And so you're, you're talking to a wall when you're talking to them. <laughs> Parents have the greatest interest in the education of their children. They should be able to have a marketplace from which to truly choose where they send their children. Now, the second point that I will raise in response to your question goes back to the personal element. Mona, in her book, talks about the problem of adolescent girls in the middle school and high school level who are often uh, unsure of themselves, understandably, at that age, uh, and are often um, extraordinarily uh, susceptible to social pressure and to belonging. And I'm sure all of you who have gone through this period know exactly what I'm talking about here. And they are forever uh, subject to be victims to the kind of sexual exploitation that goes on, largely in our schools, but also outside of them as well. Parents, again, consistent with what I said about the interest in their education, have an interest in the moral education of their children and in inspiring in them the self-confidence that would be necessary to stand athwart these pressures and give these girls the fortitude to be able to say no and to stand by that and to say to hell with social pressure and with belonging, I know who I am, I'm going to stand for it and let the chips fall where they may. There is no substitute for the individual in these kinds of situations. Or the family. It's very or hard. the family. It's very hard to do that without two parent families. Exactly. All of them are, there are wonderful stories of single mothers who do indeed inspire them. In this example that I just gave of the Miss Virginia. Uh, a movie is an example of that of a woman who did inspire in herself the kind of thing that enabled him to transcend this horrible situation he found himself in and to make something of himself. Okay, let's take some questions from the audience. Questions? This gentleman right here. You can stand up and identify yourself. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you both for coming. My name is Paul Anderson. Uh, I have a question for Roger. Uh, it's a little bit tangential to the topic at hand, but you did mention a couple of the Supreme Court's cases from the New Deal era, post-New Deal era. You mentioned how they basically turned federalism on its head uh, and that they got rid of the non-delegation doctrine. But you also seem to quote uh, uh, Griswold versus Connecticut somewhat favorably even though Griswold versus Connecticut, at least at face value, seems to kind of uh, obliterate state sovereignty with respect to domestic affairs, and it allowed the Supreme Court to intervene in 
matters such as contraception, even though they don't have history in the um, Bill of Rights or are not present in the text of the Bill of Rights. So I was wondering how you square uh, support for Bruce Wall with opposition to the other New Deal cases. Thank you. Yes, you're raising the issue of should courts uh, secure unenumerated rights. Yep. Well, the Ninth Amendment makes it clear that we have unenumerated rights. It reads, the rights enumerated in the Constitution shall not be construed to deny. No, uh, three. The enumeration of certain rights in the Constitution might be uh, construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. That amendment uh, is the obverse of the Tenth Amendment, which reads the powers of the delegated to the United States by the Constitution uh, uh, shall be reserved to the states respectively or to the people. And so when you put those two together, you have a recapitulation of the philosophy that was first set forth in the Declaration of Independence. We have rights both enumerated and unenumerated. The federal government has only those powers. That set federalism in motion, but of course there was the oblique recognition of slavery, and it took the Civil War amendments 80 years later to overturn that, which provided for the first time federal rights against state violations of our rights. Therefore, the question became, what rights are there for the states to, or for the federal government to protect these the states pursuant to the 14th Amendment's privileges and immunities clause, due process of law, and equal protection clauses? And it turns out that when you study the history of this and the theory of the matter, the Supreme Court should be in the business of protecting privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, which include the natural rights that are protected under the 14th Amendment pursuant to the 9th Amendment. And that means that, 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 means that cases like Griswold, which were enacted under the state's police power, which is the power to secure our rights, raise the question, what rights were being protected by this statute that prohibited the sale and use of contraceptives? Turns out, no one's rights were violated by the sale and use of contraceptives. So there was no authority for the state under its police power to pass such a statute and it falls to the court, which under Barbara v. Madison is the last step in reading the Constitution to say to the state of Connecticut, you have no power to enact this statute. It's no different than Lochner v. New York or Pierce v. Society of Sisters, which involve the uh, pro prohibition of sending your child to a government school and other cases of that kind. Questions on the sexual revolution. <laughs> <laughs> I will decline questions that are not directly related to the sexual revolution. I think uh, you should all bring back uh, Roger to have a, 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 a discussion with the Constitution because there's nobody better on the subject. Thank you. Uh, my name is John Milder. Uh, thanks again for a really awesome and enlightening debate. I was really happy to hear the name Mary Everstead at least a few times since I found her work on this topic very interesting, especially with regards to the possible connection between the sexual revolution and the decline of religion in American society, as you probably know, she's argued that these two go hand in hand, the sexual, sexual revolution has caused part of the decline, and that in turn declines through the sexual revolution. I'm curious, first, what are your thoughts on that? And second, on the sort of broader issue of what role, if any, religion might have in a potential solution to this. As you know, a lot of the former taboos on the subject were religious in nature. Does religion start a role to play, or is it just sort of slip too far out of that realm and we don't need to look to other areas. Um, <laughs> I don't consider myself any sort of an expert on religious matters. I would just um, perhaps observe that um, the churches and other religious institutions in our society have proved themselves to be as much creatures of a larger culture um, as other parts of America, and, and to a surprising degree. Um, they are just as much victims of the faddishness of ideas. They, um, you know, you, you can hear pastors talking about the, uh, how endemic pornography use is among Christian uh, worshipers. Um, and, um, and so it's, um, it's a struggle. Um, 
I do think that there are certain redoubts. Um, there are certain religious communities that have kept their principles and that, and that continue to provide inspiration for a sort of countercultural approach to our society. And um, thank goodness for those people. But, um, but I, I've been struck by the weakness of, uh, of many of uh, America's religious institutions when it comes to these matters. Questions? Uh, hi, my name is Josh. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for uh, coming up to the debate tonight. And also, I wanted to ask you, um, so for both of you guys, I want to ask, uh, do you think that monogamy is the only way that two people can have a relationship, like romantic and sexual? And second, if you do, explain why. <laughs> you want to start on it? <laughs> Do I think monogamy is the only way to have a romantic relationship? I mean, well, certainly monogamy is not the only way to have a relationship. There are lots of relationships in our lives that don't require exclusivity. I think romantic relationships do. Um, there have been many efforts over many decades, centuries in fact, to try to erase that aspect of human nature and to say um, that uh, we can have open marriages, we can have, uh, we can have multiple partners, and we'll both be cool with it, and uh, it never works out well. Um, the fact is that jealousy and possessiveness are part of romantic love, and um, they're there for good reasons, uh, to cement that family bond and keep others out. Kind of like when the sperm meets the egg, after that no other sperm can enter that egg, there's a chemical that's released, well, something similar should happen between couples, where when they're together, nobody else should be able to interfere. It used to actually be a tort, speaking of torts, um, tortious interference or you know, uh, alienating the affections of a party who was in a marriage was, uh, was, was a tort punishable under the state laws. Um, so, um, so I just think it's contrary to human nature to expect that people are going to be able to have successful threesomes, foursomes, or anything else. It's the first time I've ever heard the consumption theory of monogamy. Monogamy, for all the reasons that Mona has stated, is, uh, is the rule and polygamy, polyandry, and other variations of that, uh, is very much the exception. Uh, it's something in our nation as she seems to say, and rightly so, in my judgment. But to each his own, there's there seem to be people who, as we said in the 60s, different strokes for different folks. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Uh, hi, my name's Paul Weiser. Uh, thank you very much for the debate. It's uh, really excellent. Uh, so towards the end, uh, Charles Murray was brought up. Um, and in Coming Apart, he argues that uh, really the divide in America and the source of a lot of the problems in America, including some of the issues of um, uh, births outside of marriage, uh, divorce rates, uh, single parents, um, are actually accountable to uh, the growing uh, class inequality in America between upper and lower class. Um, so uh, my question would be, is there a correlation here that we perhaps haven't touched on in this debate that um, some of the issues arising from the sexual revolution could actually be um, reduced to issues of um, class and of poverty. Um, is that a fair correlation to draw, or uh, is that too strong to say? Um, I, I thought I did address that. I, I talked about the um, distinction between the upper third of our society, which is college educated, and they come from intact families and strong, stronger communities, therefore, because strong families make strong communities. Um, and then the other two-thirds of the country where um, there's a lot more chaos in adult relationships, and, uh, and that is a huge class divide, and that is something that is partly the consequence of the sexual revolution. Um, it used to be that, like back in uh, the pre-sexual revolution era, it, the, the number of unwed births was very similar in the rich part of town and in the poor part of town. There really wasn't that huge distinction. Now, uh, a high school dropout, something like 60% of women who don't finish 
high school get pregnant before they get married. And um, the number among um, college-educated women is something like 6%. So there's a huge, huge divide. And um, as I was trying to say earlier, I think it is because um, the larger culture, we don't have accepted mores that the whole culture agrees upon anymore. So instead, we have this kind of private coaching from the upper third where they say, you, my kid, are going to do things this way, because this leads to success. I'm not saying what our neighbors should do. That's fine. You know, different strokes for different folks. But you, my son or daughter, you're going to do it our way. And for those other kids, where there's no message, where there's kind of a chaotic family situation, where everybody's really afraid to say, by the way, you should really get a job, get an education, and get married before you have kids. Nobody will say that to them. They don't know it. I have talked to some of these kids. And I've asked them, did anybody in your life, I'm talking to this 16-year-old girl from a charter school in New York, did anybody in your life ever tell you that it was a good idea to get married and get a job and do all those things, you know, do the success sequence? She said, I never heard of anybody. She was great by saying, worship.